Hi, and welcome back to Paul's um, SAT Reading Comprehension Program. In this video, we're going to talk about the different kinds of questions that you'll run into. We talked in the first video about managing your time. In the second video, we talked about understanding the passage. And in this one, we're going to talk about using that understanding to answer the questions properly. So first, we're going to talk about main ideas. Uh, in the main idea questions, um, this is not a very good medium, just like it's not a very good medium to discuss uh, tone and things, uh, this, uh, and labeling. Main ideas are very, to practice analyzing main ideas, you need a whole passage, and we're not going to do that in the video. In the book, there are examples of those. Um, so check the book for examples for practice in that. Uh, but we will talk about some general concepts uh, and definitions so that you'll know what the questions are looking for. Um, questions about main ideas are usually phrased like this. The, the primary purpose of this passage is, or the primary purpose of this paragraph is, and things of that nature. Um, this is it's not the only form these questions take, but you find them in almost every single passage, and uh, they follow some sort of pattern like that. And of course, it obviously deals with the main idea of the passage or the paragraph. Um, and there are a few tricks that the questions will use to confuse you as to how to answer the question properly. Um, for example, a choice will refer to an item at the end of the passage and um, rather than the passage as a whole. The question is about the main idea, right? But the end of the passage is about, uh, the question choice refers to the end of the passage, so as to throw you off. Uh, at, say, at the, most of the passage is about dogs, and at the end it says, and cats also. So the main idea is like a history of dogs, but the answer choice says uh, that the main idea is a comparison between cats and dogs when that wasn't the case. It was only a brief discussion at the end. Um, another type would be a choice that refers to something that's, that is in the passage, but it's too small to actually represent the main idea. And that would be, uh, like I just said, uh, maybe in the last half of a paragraph, it mentions cats briefly. Um, and then the, the, it says that the main idea of the passage is a history of cats or some such thing, which is not right. Or in the middle, it, rep it mentions uh, food, dog food. And it says something about sh showing how dog food relates to the history of dogs. That doesn't work. That's not the main idea. That's only a partial supporting point. We need to be dealing with the primary purpose of main ideas. Um, another example would be a choice would use a verb that's either way too strong or it's the opposite of what is actually there. So say that the line in question <coughs> is sandwiches are good because they're healthy. And the two of the answer choices are the author denies the value of sandwiches. Now, this is tricky because you're talking about the author and sandwiches, but then maybe you skip over denies. Or the author worships the value of sandwiches. That's tricky because he does say they're good, but worship is way too strong for what he's saying. Um, and then there are many other ways similar to this that will, they will use to distract you. And we will talk about this expand this, but these are much most often used in main idea questions, these particular types. Um, many times the main idea is clearly located in an easy spot, right at the beginning of the passage or right at the beginning of the paragraph. Um, but just as often, this isn't the case. Uh, and when the main idea is hidden, you need to be thinking about what the author is doing in the passage. Now, this is pretty vague, but you need to think about what verb you can best use to describe the, what the author is doing. Um, for questions like what's the primary purpose, um, just break it down to a single verb. Is the analyzing? Is she criticizing? Is she warning somebody? Think of, if you can, if you can uh, summarize the whole passage into one single verb, that's what you're going to want to do for these passages. Um, use that fact to isolate the likely and unlikely answers for this example. Um, the, the, the text is, I hate anything that isn't a sandwich. So if the question is asking you, what's the primary purpose? You said the primary purpose of this passage is to now just say, for example, is, could they be analyzing something here, justifying something, giving historical context, disproving or conceding? 
Now, th again, this is just an, uh, a, an intellectual exercise. If someone says, I hate anything that is in a sandwich, would you be analyzing, justifying, giving historical context, disproving? Analyzing is probably not what you're going to be doing. Hate is not usually involved in analysis, right? Um, justify might make sense. Like if you're saying, I will never eat sandwiches again because I hate, or I will never eat anything but sandwiches again, this would justify that. It supports an opinion. Historical context, again, probably not going to be historical because you're talking about hating things. It's a little strong for intellectual analysis. To disprove, um, possibly it's strongly against any non-sandwich items. It disprove might work. Concede, probably not. You'd really have to find support for that because you're strongly against something. You're probably not going to give anything to it. Uh, and this it would not never be a total answer. It would always be analyze the something something or justify the something something. But with main ideas, you can often really isolate what's going to be right or wrong based on just that first verb in the question. Um, and of course, be careful and make sure you're playing these topics to the whole passage and not just to individual points. Because maybe one paragraph does disprove something, but the primary purpose of the passage is not to disprove things. So, uh, Another type of question is dealing with the purpose of things. Um, the, the, or, or the purpose of a sentence, or the purpose of a comparison, the purpose of anything. Um, there are questions that ask you about the specific purpose of quotes, or uh, purpose of uh, contrasting pairs, purpose of many things um, that we discussed in the last video. So, for example, the quote in lines four to seven serves to what? This is another very common kind of question. These types of questions are usually going to have you, you have to re understand the relationship between a thing and another thing. That this thing relates to this thing in this way. Right? This quote relates to this point of view. Uh, and uh, the main idea, the tone, or another thing. So say that the main uh, that the author's point of view is against sandwiches, like we said, or pro sandwiches, like we said before. And the quote says, I don't like sandwiches. So the quote serves to reinforce the author's opinion of sandwiches. Now, even though it's a smaller level, it's similar strategies with the main idea. Uh, be aware of the, the wrong choice of verb, an opposite perspective, verbs that are too strong or completely off topic. Uh, and uh, for more specific examples of main idea and purpose questions, look at the book for those chapters. These are difficult to do without full text. Uh, so look in the book on the main purpose, a main idea and purpose and for practice on those type of questions. Next one we'll talk about is tone. This is a little easier to talk about in a video. Identifying tone is difficult if you don't have a lot of reading experience, if your vocabulary is lower, if you're, you haven't been exposed to a lot of different types of reading, it's, it's a little more difficult. Uh, but keep up with your vocabulary. Uh, many tones are set but only by a particular word or phrase. So, for example, take this sentence, I don't like sandwiches, he said angrily. The word angrily sets one particular tone versus I don't like sandwiches, he said with a smile. It completely changes the tone, these two words. And oftentimes, the questions are based on single words that have a massive impact on the tone, on the author's point of view, on anybody's point of view regarding the main subject. Uh, and it's rarely, it's almost never as easy as this, but there are dozens of possible tones that you might see. Um, and don't try to memorize all the possible tones you could possibly run into. It's rarely going to be necessary for you to know the difference between whimsical and fanciful. Uh, there is a slight difference between whimsical and fanciful, but you're never going to need to know that. Uh, the most important thing to identify is whether or not the tone is strongly positive, like amazed or awestruck, or the tone is lightly positive, like amused or nostalgic, neutral, like analytical, curious or ironic, lightly negative, like apathy, disbelief, or being skeptical, or strongly negative, like contempt, outrage, urgency, hatred. This uh, hierarchy is what they ask questions about. Is the, question, is the tone of this passage very strongly positive, or is it positive but, less pos uh, but not over the top? Um, 
it's always going to be easy to tell the difference between a negative tone and a positive tone, but the questions are always between like, is it neutral or lightly negative? Is it neutral or strongly negative? Is it lightly positive or strongly positive? That's the biggest distinction you're going to have to be able to make. And of course, there are way, way, way more tones than this. And there is a uh, glossary of tone words in the book. Um, definitely not going to go through all of them here. There are dozens upon dozens of possible tones that you could run into. But the most important thing is knowing which ones are strongly negative, lightly negative, neutral, lightly positive, and strongly positive, and they are organized in the book in that fashion. Um, the most difficult thing you'll need to be able to do is tell, like I said, those things. Um, now, for the most part, most questions and most passages are not strongly positive or strongly negative. Um, and so, because it's rare to run into writing that is very passionate in these things. It's not, it's not often extremely humorous. It's not often wacky. It's not often despairing and hatred and anger and poetic um, license. So most of the time, if you make a choice on tone, go with the softer choice. And usually if it is stronger, you're going to know. But you do want to keep an eye out for words like hatred and dislike and love. Take the time to familiarize, familiarize yourself with the terms that are in the book, um, and especially the positive and negative uh, connotations associated with words that you study when you're studying vocabulary. Get to know the feeling of the words as well as the definitions. Um, and that's why it's important to study vocabulary over and over and over again. The whole time you're prepping for the test, never stop studying vocab. Just vocab should be your number one priority and almost all the time. Not just for CENCOM questions like we talked about before, or for, but for reading comprehension and everything. Okay, the next step, actually answering the questions. Um, the final step of answering the questions, how can you be sure if you've chosen the right answer or not for a question? You've looked at the question, you've gone back to the passage, how can you be sure whether you've chosen the correct answer or not? And just to be sh sure, every question has only one correct answer, okay? Uh, that should, hopefully is obvious, but there is only one correct answer, and all the others are wrong, and all the wrong choices are provably wrong by something in the passage. And every right question is provably right by something in the passage. It may not be immediately obvious, but there is an explanation for why every wrong question is wrong and every right question is right. It's just hard to see sometimes. You don't understand why or how it is the fact that this is wrong and this is right. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, but let's, this is the process you need to follow for every single question every single time. First, read the question carefully. Make sure you're not missing anything, right? Make sure that there is no word that you're overlooking. Make sure you have comprehension of what the question's asking you to do. Step two, go back to the passage before you read the answers. Like I said, I don't want to have to harp on this. Do, do not, do not, do not read the answer choices before you've come up with your own answer. It is the number one thing you can do to best increase your score. And number three, then choose your answer after you've made your choice. Um, and even if you're sure that A is right, like you thought of your answer for the question, you went back and like, oh yeah, definitely A, that's exactly what I said. You still want to go through and do a quick run through of why B, C, D, and E are wrong. It really, especially when you're practicing. In the, when you're in the test time, maybe you save a little bit of time, but get used to marking things off in your head, of why it's wrong and why it's right. If you can't decide between two choices, decide which of the choices requires more proof. If you got it down to B and E, decide which one requires more proof. For example, say the question asks you, the tone of this passage is irritated or enraged. Now these are very close to each other, but as we talked about with tone, one is weaker than the other one. Um, in either case, the tone is unhappy. It's going to be negative, but how negative, how unhappy? Which one is going to require more proof that it's the correct choice? Well, let's say the, the point in question is this. Every time the doorbell rings, I get an urge to disconnect it forever. Okay? Now, is this irritated or enraged? 
Take a moment, think for yourself, come up with your own answer. Is this sentence irritated or enraged? Well, enraged is extremely strong. Enraged is you're out of your mind with anger. So we need some support for being out of your mind with anger. Now, while this does seem somewhat angry, disconnect forever doesn't, it doesn't, disconnect is not a violent word. There's no connotation of violence with disconnect. That you have to go to the drawer, get a screwdriver, unscrew it. That's not violent, that's not enraged. So while it does seem um, negative, we know that it's not enraged because we have no proof. We have no proof. Irritated should be, it, maybe this isn't the tone. Irritated is not the first tone you would say for this, but it's what the choices that you're giving and it's better than enraged. Uh, an enraged sentence might be something like this. Every time the doorbell rings, I get an urge to rip it out of the wall. Now that's violent. That shows anger. That supports that strong tone of enraged. Um, and so he's definitely irritated would be far too weak in this case. Now, most of the time, it's going to be the weaker choice. Most of the time, it's going to be irritated. If you can't really figure it out and you're running out of time, and you think you've spent too long with the question, go with the weaker choice because that's what it's going to be most of the time. And most of the time, when it's a strong tone, you're going to know right away. Um, so this is really the only real secret of the test, and this it works out pretty well. When you've got a 50-50 choice, go with the more general or weaker toned answer choice because most of the time that's going to be the case. It's not always the case. And some books and some teachers will tell you, oh, it's always the weaker question. No, 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 no. They know that. They know that people know this fact. So they don't do that. On, they purposefully choose passages that are strong in tone to ask questions about them. But more often than not, and this is true, more often than not, it is the weaker choice when you've got it down to 50-50. Uh, usually you can't make up your mind because you can't find the proof for the one that you don't want to let go. You can't disprove it and because it's not there. You know that this one is poorly defined. Uh, this is too general and you can't find proof for it. It's hard for you to supply or you know, find the proof in the passage for the general question, but you also can't find the result for the strong question. So you're torn up like, why can't I prove this? You can't prove it because they're doing that on purpose. They're purposefully trying to confuse you. Remember, every single answer can be proven or disproven with some piece of information for the text. Every single answer has something. If you're confused, that means you are you didn't comprehend it. If you got down to like three questions, if you have I mean, three answer choices, then you were not comprehending something. If you got it down to three, then you're missing some vital piece of information. I suggest you reread it, right? Um, every single answer can be proven or disproven, which leads us to our final, sec uh, final section of this video is eliminating answer choices, right? You've got the question, how do you choose which ones are right and which ones are wrong? The incorrect answer choices fall into particular ways in which they're incorrect. The people who make the SAT have a system and it's easy to recognize the system once you spend a lot of time with how they ask these questions. Uh, they change things up every now and then. Some things are kind of out there, a little unusual for them. But by and large, when you see one question, it falls into a type. They're testing particular things about what you can do. And the ways that the answers are wrong fall into a number of different categories, like I talked about, like too strong, too general. And we're going to talk about how these choices are incorrect or correct. Uh, if you can familiarize yourself with these types, you'll be able to recognize them more quickly and more easily. And be like, oh, I see what they're doing. I see what you did there. They're going to be able to do that. Um, now, they do phrase the correct answers in a similar way. They make everything look samey. They make things look the same. So you have to pay attention to the details, but uh, it gets easier and easier for you to recognize wrong answers just because of the way that they put things. Uh, you can see how they're trying to s trick you and slip you up. So let's take a look at some common distraction methods that they use on the test. Um, one way that they do it is the answer choice was not mentioned in the text. It's literally not there. And this happens more than you think. Um, it's actually something similar. For example, the text mentions surfing uh, and the wrong answer choice mentions swimming. That is often common. Sometimes it's really absurdly out there. Like it's really, the text mentions surfing and the wrong answer mentions like riding sharks or like 
hiking on volcanoes or something like that. Like sometimes it's just completely out there. You can re remove it quite easily. Um, another type of wrong answer is questions where the topic is not actually in the, that point of the text. It, the topic is mentioned in the text, but in a different part of the passage. So the question refers to lines four, uh, for example, line six, and the uh, answer choice refers to line 45. The question is asking you about mm, dogs. And in line 45, it mentions cats, and the answer choice is like, ah, oh, cats. That's a not here type answer. Um, now, not the issue answers. Say the two answers look almost identically the same, but one of the choices focuses on the wrong aspect of the topic at hand. So the passage refers to a person's love of dogs. And the question, the answer choice, claims that dogs are the main idea rather than the person's love of them. You can see how this would be tricky. You gotta worry about what the question is focused on. And this is very common. Even the highest level students will get tossed up if the, if the trick of the question is the focus of a particular thing. Another type of question are opposites, um, where the answer choice is literally the opposite of the point. And this is trickier than you think, um, because there's only one small difference in the example. Uh, we talked about how earlier how the verb choices might be purposefully the opposite. Um, and so you read the question, and you go back to the passage, and you think, aha, he's saying that the author loves tomatoes, right? And so you go to the question, and here you go, B. The point is the author loves potatoes. And, but you're thinking too quickly. You're, passion, uh, you're, you're, you're quickly trying to get through the test, and you don't notice that it says potatoes instead of the tomatoes that you're actually looking for. This happens a lot. Or it says hate instead of love. And it says the author of something's tomatoes, and you, ha, but it was hate, the opposite of what you're looking for. This happens quite often. Over-inference, uh, and in, the, in a future video we'll talk more about inference, very common uh, and involves reaching past the implications in the text into stories which would be justified if there were more clues in the text. Uh, this is the most common mistake made by students who have scores over 600, is you have two answer choices that are really close, and it's plausible that the text, if you had more information, that this would happen. But it's not in the text. Okay, for example, Joe had a good relationship with his colleagues. Now, you can infer a lot from this. The man likes, is liked with, likes and is liked by his colleagues. Okay, now we can infer that they were friendly with each other. This is not a lot of information. We don't have a lot to go on here. We can infer that they were often friendly. We can't infer that they were always friendly, right? Because good relationship does not mean you are constantly friendly with your coworkers. Maybe they had a disagreement. Good relationship does not mean 100%. But in too much would be Joe liked being at work more than anything. This is over inference. You could make up a story. If you had a little bit more information, you might be able to infer this. But with just this line, it's not possible. You don't have enough to support it logically. Another one would be, Joe never had any arguments with his colleagues. This is far too much, way too much inference. Joe's colleagues were his best friends. That's even trickier. They loved this one. Joe's colleagues were his best friends. Does it say anything about best? Does it say anything about 100%? Does it say anything about most? No, so you, this is a wrong choice. False alternatives. Um, the choice claims that a comparison or choice is made that is not in the text. This is a little tricky. Um, there were, uh, they were better than other researchers when they only disagreed. Um, say that the passage indicates that there is some minor conflict, but it blows up the conflict beyond what it should be. Uh, say, Bill walked past the door, uh, whereas this kind of false alternative would be Bill never went into any doors. It's not quite the same thing as the over-inference, because there is a connection being made here, but if in the text it said Bill walked past the door, and then the false alternative was Bill hated doors. That's not the same thing. That's not a connection that you can make. It's a false choice to be made. 
Um, two specific or question, uh, answer choices that are too specific or too general. We talked about this a lot. Um, like the main idea questions, they seem tempting, but it's only a small part of the overall picture or they're far too broad. The passage says something about sandwiches and the answer choice says the passage is about hamburgers. Hamburgers are a type of sandwich, but that's far too specific. That's not the point. The po po point was about sandwiches in general and hamburger is only one small subset, right? And the other said, it says the passage about food, which is even a larger one than what the passage was about. So you gotta find what hierarchy it's on. Too specific or too general. Uh, and finally, rulemaking. Uh, similar to the general or over-inference answers um, or the, uh, the false alternatives, they're ones that are hard to refute but are go too far. So in the passage it says, Lou Gehrig was a fantastic baseball player, even at 45 years old. It goes way too far to say that the passage is not saying that older people are good at sports or that we should respect the elderly. This is really common. These make some of the most difficult questions. There's uh, always, in this case, this feels wrong. You can't deny that older people might be good at sports or that we should respect the elderly or even that the passage or the author might agree with it. But this is far too general. It's too much. And that's what you need to look out for. Um, there are many ways that the test is going to try to trick you. And the best way to succeed is to read carefully, read the whole passage, and get used to seeing these logical fallacies committed by the answer choices on the test, what kind of tricks they're going to pull. So let's review what we went over in this video. First, how should you describe a main idea? Well, you should figure out what the author is trying to do, figure out the verb of what the author is trying to do. Is he trying to explain? Is he trying to inform? Is he trying to persuade? Is he trying to argue a point? That's what you need to try to figure out for main ideas. Try to boil it down into one verb um, and then expand that into a sentence. How should you describe tone? That's uh, how is the author saying it? What is, the, what, what, what is the author saying and how is he saying it? What words are you using? What emotions? Is it positive, negative? Um, remember, the most important would be strongly positive, lightly positive, neutral, lightly negative, and strongly negative. That's what you need to figure out. How can I describe the purpose of a thing? Well, what is it doing to other things? What is the relationship between this thing that you found? The uh, quote, the problem, the question, the term, the point of view, the contrasting pair. What is, how is that related to other things in the passage? And how are they interacting with one another? How can I be sure that I answered the question correctly? Simply put, prove your choice and disprove the others. If you can do that, you've got the right choice and you should do that every single time. In the next video, we're gonna discuss a, a particular type of question, uh, which is the vocab in context question. Uh, and these can be tricky, especially for ESL students. Um, but in general, you need to have a good strategy for dealing with these because almost every single passage has one or two of these. So if you have a good strategy, a reliable strategy for these, you can really increase your score. So the next video, we'll talk about vocab and context questions. Thank you, we'll see you then.